Hello, this is Candidate Conversations. I'm Nick Gibson, a local government reporter for the Spokesman Review, and I'm here today to speak with Miguel Valencia, a Democratic candidate for the state Senate seat in Washington's 4th Legislative District. Uh, Miguel, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, thanks for being here today. Uh, to start, uh, we've been giving candidates the opportunity to kind of make their pitch to the voters. Uh, so why should voters elect you this November? Yeah, I think that voters should elect um, me because in the 4th Legislative District, especially, I think that um, a lot of voters there deserve to have a candidate that's going to support the issues that working class people care about about lowering the cost of health care, about having working families being able to afford the cost of child care, um, to, for parents to not have to worry about how much it's going to cost to send their kids to college or to a trade school so that they can get a good job, um, and to have a, a senator or representative that actually supports unions and will strike with workers and um, will be pushing for workers to be able to bargain for higher wages and benefits. That's the main reason why... Um, I believe I'm the best person in this race to represent the people of the 4th Legislative District. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, this is your, your first run at elected office. Uh, so what kind of motivated you uh, to make that step? And then if you could just provide a little background for voters who uh, may not know you as well. Sure. Yeah. So I guess first I'll start, yeah, why I decided to run in this race. Um, initially, I was the first person to announce they're running in this race. Actually, was, Mike Patton was still the current state senator when I announced, and um, I had seen in previous years he has run unopposed, or I think one time an independent candidate ran against him, um, and uh, I think there was a Democratic candidate in 2020, but from what I heard, he did no campaigning at all, just kind of like just putting himself on the ballot. So I thought, well, he definitely shouldn't run unopposed, and this was in February of this year, so I feel like, you know, I feel like I didn't have a choice. I was like, somebody has to run against him. So I put my name in there, and then, of course, like a couple months later, uh, I like to joke around that I'm the reason why he decided to retire. Um, uh, he probably didn't want to run another campaign. Um, but then it actually became a fun little primary. You know, there was four Republicans that jumped in, and there was another Democrat that was in the race. So then it, I was like, all right, let's 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 get it going. Let's uh, actually campaign and do this, and um, let's have somebody that finally in the 4th Legislative District actually talks about working class issues, um, which I think none of my opponents have done or are doing. Um, and so my background to that is uh, I grew up, I was born here in Spokane, and I was raised in a small town called Othello, Washington. Uh, I was really involved there. I, I was student body president. I was in speech and debate, was a band kid. Um, from there, I joined the Army as a paralegal specialist. Uh, got stationed at JBLM in Tacoma. Uh, didn't do much with politics there because when you're active duty, it's kind of like you shouldn't really get involved with politics. And then uh, once I got out of the Army, I was like, well, I think I want to go back to like Eastern Washington. So I, I moved to Yakima for like maybe like five months. And then I was like, this ain't it. Let's go to Spokane. And then I've been here ever since. And um, here's where like I, I got married. I started having my family. I have two kids. I have a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old, and I actually have another one due next month. Um, so uh, it's, it's been a, a fun ride. I'm also a, a current part-time law student at Seattle U. Um, most of it is online. I do have to go to Seattle every once in a month, every once in a while. And uh, I'm also in the National Guard now, So, uh, and I've been in the National Guard for the past three years. And so that usually actually does require me also going to Tacoma every month for drill. So um, I keep myself busy. Um, I feel like it's really important to be involved with the community, um, listen to people. I've had lunch with or talked to at length with most of my opponents. I, I've had lunch with Mike Kelly, with Al Merkel. I've probably had lunch with him like three times and we talk a bit. Um, I've talked at length with Leonard. Uh, most of my approach is like, let's see what we can agree on. Like, uh, I had lunch with Mike Kelly a little bit ago, and he was telling me that one of the things that we agree about is uh, having employees be able to buy stock in their uh, the companies that they work for, uh, and we're overall supportive of the employee-owned businesses. Um, when I talk to Al, we usually talk 
his thing is like the Growth Management Act isn't necessarily uh, easy to navigate as him as a city council member. And um, he thinks there should be different ways to fund police departments and stuff like that so that they have more ability to hire more police officers, which I tend to at least, you know, uh, be sympathetic to that message. When I talked to Leonard, uh, he told me that the the House Republican caucus was talking about extending the amount of paid parental leave. And that's something that I've been hammering away and on the campaign trail as well. So um, I try to find those issues where we agree on and that we can move forward. And uh, growing up in a small rural conservative town, and a lot of my buddies grew up to be Republicans, uh, and I'm still friends with them to this day, I think I, I have that ability to like respect other people's opinions, but find what we agree on. And uh, we can usually agree on that we want working families to do better. We want working families to be able to afford health care, not go into medical bankruptcy because of an unexpected health care bill. We usually do agree that um, our kids deserve to have a good education, and they shouldn't go into tens of thousands of dollars of student debt to be able to get that education. Um, we usually even Surprising, a surprising number of Republican, at least the voters, um, are supportive of unions, and they support the fact that workers should have a say in their workplace. So, um, yeah, that's the reason why I'm running. I think I'm, I'm giving some people that have not had a voice in the 4th Legislative District before. I think that's what I'm doing. Well, thank you for sharing that. I was, I was hoping to touch on, uh, you know, it's not easy for a Democrat to be elected in the 4th Legislative District, uh, and you had kind of talked about, you know, some of your conservative challenges there. Uh, but in the primary, you did eke out with uh, the most votes. Yeah, I um, the the primary was interesting to see, um, especially considering that Mike Kelly, who got third just below uh, Leonard, he spent like $75,000 on the primary. I spent something like $5,000. Um, and Leonard spent about like thirty, dollars um, but he's also the current sitting representative. Um, and then Pam did, you know, pa Pam and Al were about kind of tied with each other also, just like sitting at like 13, 12%. Um, so it was interesting to see. Um, I mean, I like to kind of boast about the fact that, you know, I'm a 25 year old Mexican American um, son of an immigrant in the fourth legislative district that is probably most popularly known as having Representative Matt Shea um, get more votes than a sitting representative than the s current mayor of Spokane Valley and a current Spokane Valley City Council member and the most well funded candidate in the race that was also endorsed by the county Republican Party and the current state senator. Um, so I think it was good. But, uh, you know, I am realistic about the math as well. You know, the, you combine all the Republican votes and you combine all the Democratic votes. I am at a pretty good disadvantage. But that's why I do try to connect with conservative voters as much as I can. Uh, I think that there is a good chunk of conservative voters that are also just concerned about, like, corruption in politics. They think the system is brought into its core. They think big money funds uh, political campaigns and politicians do the bidding of their donors, which I believe is true. And uh, I think that's one thing that I can resonate with them on. You know, Leonard, he gets, uh, he has received donations from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, he's received donations from Avista, uh, from Chevron. So I don't know how you, you give those facts to the voters, even if they're conservative. I mean, uh, he's getting donations from Avista. I mean, how can you trust Leonard to be able to fight to try to pass a bill that would lower your utility rates because it's completely contra contradictory to Vista making profits. You know, how can you uh, trust them when it comes to lowering the cost of your health insurance when a private health insurance company funds its campaign, you know? So I feel like even though they might disagree with me, they at least know that I'm coming from an honest place. Mo most of my money has either come from unions or from individual contributions. So. Well, thanks for revisiting that. For We covered the primary uh, pretty thoroughly, and, you know, we're going to be continuing to follow this until the general election. Um, I wanted to kind of pivot to some of the issues. Uh, just to kind of start, what do you view as the top issues facing the district right now? Yeah, so 
a lot of people in my race, they always point to public safety as being the top issue. And usually by that, they mean like um, they want people to stop overdosing on fentanyl on the side of the streets or they just want more police officers, et cetera, et cetera. I have a lot more of a broader range of what public safety means. To me, it means um, every child needs to be fed. Um, to me, it's a matter of public safety if we have children that are going to school and they're not able to eat lunch. That's why I'm supportive of a universal school lunch program. That, to me, is a public safety issue. Um, I think it's a public safety issue if people aren't going to the hospital or if they're not calling the ambulance because they think they're not going to be able to afford the bill. I think that's a public safety issue. So that's why I believe in a universal health care system. I think it's a public safety issue um, on a lot of other kind of in that realm of social safety net programs. I think those all kind of fit into the overview of public safety. And I also think that it, within that role of public safety, that also does mean if somebody's homeless, give them somewhere to live, uh, make sure that they're, they're able to get housed or that we pass policies that make housing more affordable for everybody. I think um, I was listening to, uh, I think it was some county executive from King County, but he was citing a research study done by UW, and they were talking about how the number one cause of homelessness is um, the availability of housing. It, it's uh, Most of what we see on the streets is people that are probably affected by mental health, by um, being addicted to drugs, but um, that's not the majority of homeless people. The majority is uh, they're down on their luck. They uh, aren't able to afford the housing or, you know, they lost their job, something like that. That's usually the most common thing. And a lot of people aren't um, captured in that, you know, because they'll, you know, lose their job and then maybe stick like, hey, ask their brother or their sister, can I stay at your place for a week or two before I figure things out? Things like that. Um, so I have a lot. I guess the number one issue is public safety, but that one issue encapsulates so many other issues and so many other things. Because um, I think when, when you take care of people's health care, when you take care of people's education, when you ca take care of people's um, wages, um, that's when you're going to see a society that has good public safety because the people are already being taken care of. They're not um, resorting to some other fast way of making money that might be illegal or they're not um, down on their luck as much because we as a society have agreed that, hey, brother, you're down on, on your luck. I'm going to help you out, you know. Well, thank you for sharing that perspective. I uh, You mentioned housing a little bit there, uh, and there were a couple housing measures that came up during the last session and, you know, kind of keep popping up here in the state, especially in Olympia. Um, on the renter side of things, one of the things that's been proposed is a cap on annual increases in rent. Uh, is that something that you would support if elected? I think I would. Uh, I, I feel like I still need to read more about it and see other places that have implemented a, a rent cap, I tend to think that it would be a good idea because I do tend to think that there is a sort of disparity between the power between a land lord and the tenant on negotiating what the rent price is. Um, of course, people worry about, like, let's say we put the cap at, like, 7%, that landlords are going to just automatically raise it 7% every year. Um, but if we look at let's put the past 20 years into context. If there had been a 7% rent cap um, since the year 2000, rent in Seattle now would be cheaper than it is because we just like left it to be because housing prices increased like 50% over the course of from 2020 to now, um, which, you know, I mean, housing prices have increased a lot more than just 7% a year if you're thinking about just the past 20 years. So at short term, it kind of looks like it could be like, oh man, 7% guaranteed every year. Um, but over the course of a period of time, it might still be a good idea. Um, I would say that I'm like 80% supportive of it. I feel like I just need a little bit more to get me to do a yes vote on it, but I, I think it's a good idea. Well, thank you. Um... And then, you know, kind of the other half of the housing market uh, is home ownership. 
uh, and you've talked a lot about how important it is for you to advocate for the working class. Um, what do you think could be done at the state level to increase paths to home ownership or to um, increase the housing stock in the state? That's also pointed to as right. you know one of the contributors to homelessness. Yeah, I think the housing stock is like one of the primary ways that we're going to have to address this issue. Um, I honestly, Spokane is one of the leaders in trying to address the housing issue with relaxing like land use regulations and allowing like six plexes to be built next to a single family homes. I think that needs to be like a statewide thing. I think like, let's just let people build housing where they want to build housing and uh, promote density as much as we can so that um, overall that will end up lowering the cost of housing for people. And I think I read a study that within the next four years in the state of Washington, to make sure that we try to make housing affordable, we need to build something like 200,000 houses. And that's just in the next four years. And probably over the course of the next like 20 years, we need to build something like 2 million houses. Um, so whatever we can do in the legislature to encourage the building of houses and density and um, whether it's relaxing land use regulations and uh, you know giving incentives to municipalities to promote um, dense housing, I'm totally in support of that kind of stuff. And sort of those more mixed-use sites. Right. You know, when we, here ADUs, in town, we think of Kendall Yards, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Kendall Yards is a good example of good planning, and it's a fun area, and people like going there, and yeah. All right. Well, um, semi-related to housing, the limits on how much local jurisdictions can raise property taxes each year, uh, they're set around 1% right now. Uh, many cities and counties have come forward asking for that bar to be raised to 3%. Uh, this would be without voters' approval each year. Um, is that something you would be supportive of? Yeah, in a, in a way. So one of the, one of the ideas I have is um, because we are, it is currently capped at 1%, and I think this is a good way of selling it to people, too, is uh, perhaps we cap it at 1% for houses worth under a million dollars. And then maybe we have a cap of like 2% for houses worth over a million dollars. And for houses worth over $10 million, maybe that cap is 3%. Um, and we can kind of play with that. I kind of think because especially here in the state of Washington, where our tax system is so regressive and we don't have a state income tax, that one of the ways we could try to address that issue since we get a good chunk of our taxes from the property taxes is to have a progressive property tax system. The more your house is worth, perhaps a little bit more of the taxes you pay. Look at, you know, probably the, I think the average cost of a house in Spokane County is somewhere between $400,000, $450,000. So yeah, keep it at 1% for those. And uh, so yeah, basically what, what I said, like 1% for houses under a million, 2% for 10 million and then anything above that maybe we can put the cap at three percent or higher depending on what people want yeah uh so your opponent um kind of while we're on the you know topic of housing and and properties and everything like that your opponent leonard christian has said you know some of the state's mandates and some of the state's changes to the building code and those changes you know try to emphasize more renewable energy uh, sources and appliances that use renewable energy. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of things like natural gas in the state or, you know, as we try to reach these climate commitment goals that have been laid out? Yeah. So first I want to just start off with like, I believe climate change is real. I believe that we have to address climate change. I have small kids. I care about their future. I want them to be able to live a long, healthy life and, Honestly, I'm pretty young myself. I'm only 25. I, I feel like I got a lot of life to live, and I don't want to see our Earth in a climate crisis. So I do think that addressing climate changes should be one of the top priorities of the legislature. That being said, um, we have to make sure that when we are moving towards having renewable energy and moving towards a more green future, that we're not... Um, leaving behind working class people and we're not leaving behind um, people where the change might be difficult. I think I'm more of like an incentive guy instead of like a punishment guy. So like I think giving a credit to families that make under a certain amount, giving them a credit to change their stove from gas to electric, but not forcing them to do it where, you know, it kind of just makes monetary sense to do the switch versus forcing them to do it. I think most people will do it. I don't think it's right 
for the legislature saying by this year you have to have this you have to have an electric stove or you're going to be breaking the law or something like that which i think is kind of like the fear mongering that they they're trying to do trying to say that they're going to take away your gas stoves or whatever i i have a gas stove i don't think there's gonna be cops breaking into my door in 10 years or whatever saying give me your stove or else you know <laughs> i think it's a way for them to kind of fear monger and stuff but i definitely you know i'm very mindful of especially growing up in a small rural town in adams county which is one of the poorest counties in the state of washington of people that they aren't able to afford doing certain changes that are better for the environment. So I think the state should do something to incentivize and where it makes monetary sense for them to do the change. And it's not a detriment to, you know, their pocketbooks or where they're going to be like, oh my gosh, if I have to do this, I'm going to be broke. I'm not going to be able to pay rent next month. Yeah. So more kind of incentive programs to assist with that, with that transition. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I wanted to ask, what would you say to voters who, who may be concerned about your lack of legislative experience? This is your, your first bid for office. Yeah, I think that um, if that's one of the concerns you have, then um, look at Leonard Christian's record. I mean, his record is not that great. Look at the things he supports. Look at the money he takes in. He might have experience, but that experience is not good, in my opinion. So look at the things that I say I'm going to do look at the things I have done by communicating with people that are from the opposing party of me or um, the relationships I've made. Um, don't, experience isn't everything when it comes, because that, if I get, ele let's say I get elected and in four years I want to run for re-election. If I didn't do anything, <laughs> if I didn't pass a single bill or um, the things I was supporting are things that everybody is against, that experience to the voters <laughs> should be kind of like a negative. should be like, well, he didn't do anything. I think it's the same thing with Leonard. Um, you know, sure, he's been in there, and he's been running for office since, like, 2012 for, like, a bunch of different offices. He's run for, like, county auditor, I think assessor. Um, he was appointed to the position in 2014. Um, and he kind of, in a way, won this seat because de he was running against Rob Chase, and Democrats decided that Leonard is probably the more moderate between the two. So... I, I think that that experience isn't everything. Look at the policies. Look at the kind of person um, is wanting to run. I've heard Leonard in several interviews and at candidate forums answer the question why he's running. He usually answers the question with, I know I'm a, I'm a current representative in the fourth. This is like a step up for me. This is like the next place for me in my career. What I don't hear in that answer is, you know, I'm like I'm running to represent the people of the fourth legislative district. It's not really about me. It's about the people that live in the district. So if that's your gripe, you know, go to my website, look at my policies. There's not really much policies on Leonard Christian's website. Um, you know, give me a call. Let's have lunch together. If you have any concerns about what I'm going to be doing when I'm in Olympia, feel free to reach out to me, you know. Well, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Um, are there any issues we haven't touched on yet uh, that you'd like to that you'd like to before we wrap up? Sure. Yeah. If there's um, anybody that might be undecided or um, especially if you're a woman listening to this podcast, just I, w I would like to point out that Leonard Christian doesn't support any exceptions for abortion. He, even if you are raped or a creation of incest, he doesn't think there should be any exceptions for that. And we feel a good hit of what an abortion ban is like living in the fourth. We're right next door to Idaho where they do have an abortion ban and we've seen the effects. 25% of OBGYNs have left Idaho. In northern Idaho, they lost a maternal health care center. Those people are coming here now for health care. What Leonard's idea for abortion, if he were able to get any movement on that here in Washington State, it would be detrimental to women's health and reproductive rights. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, any final thoughts before, before we get out of here? No, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. I think we had a good, fun conversation. Thank you for taking the time today. Uh, and in the general election this November, folks can uh, look for your name next to Leonard Christian in the 4th Legislative District. Absolutely. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you.